Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us on this episode of the Akkad and Coca Reports. I'm Michelle Akkad, your co-host in San Francisco, and with me is Anish, as always, in Philadelphia. We are delighted to have with us, um, as our guest, Lisa Rosenbaum, who is the best medical writer today, bar none. And this is an opinion that I hold, that, that Anish holds, and we're not saying this just, you know, uh, you know, just to... Uh, for gratuitous uh, compliments. Um, Lisa is absolutely the best um, medical writer today. For those of you who don't know Lisa, I'm not going to be able to tell you much because she is a master of uh, online privacy and she has not provided me with a bio as I've asked her to do. So <laughs> all I can say is that she's a cardiologist she is, of course, the national, a national correspondent for the New England Journal of Medicine, and she publishes uh, essays on, uh, in the New England Journal, uh, you know, maybe three, four, five times a year or so. Um, prior to that, at some point, she was a regular writer and contributor to The New Yorker, also on medical topics, and her, her essays there were just fantastic. They are important. They're always on important topics, they are on a, a wide um, variety of different topics, some cardi you know, cardiac topics, but not, not just cardiac, just, just a wide variety of very important topics. They are daring and courageous because Lisa does not, you know, um, she will treat the subject comprehensively, um, but she won't just give the, on the one hand this, on the other hand that, you know, you make up your mind. No, she will, you know, her, her position, you know, comes through but it's very comprehensive, very nuanced, very, fa very fair and balance, balanced. And it's also very unpretentious. You know, the, the, the writing is very unpretentious, which is not true for many medical writers. Many me medical writers, you know, there's a little sense of, uh, you know, a pretension in the writing. Uh, that's all I can say. Lisa, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. It is so great to have you. And uh, we, you know, in preparing to the, for this, there, there are so many pieces we wanted to talk about. We had, uh, at some point, we had, we thought we might talk about two or three different pieces. But I think right now we're going to start with one, um, which you wrote uh, about a year ago, uh, or published about a year ago in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, the title is, The Less is More Crusade. Are we over-medicalizing or over-simplifying? And uh, and I think we, we'll have enough to talk about that is going to occupy most of the most of the time here. Um, this is a great paper. Give us the background if you can uh, in, in a few minutes. Yeah, sure. So um, as you said, um, the piece was published probably a year ago, but I've probably been thinking about it for a decade. Um, when I was a resident, I started getting interested in the data coming out of Dartmouth about waste and variation, and more specifically was interested in these decisions that I was making that seemed rather arbitrary, especially when I was triaging and working down in the ED as a medical senior, and feeling like I always erred on the side of doing more. And I sort of became very captivated by this narrative that, I mean, it was right in the throes of, um, you know, before the ACA was passed, but so much debate about, you know, excess spending and what we were going to do about it. And so I soon became a cardiology fellow and um, in New York City, where, you know, not really known for its resource savvy care. And I just found this whole idea extremely compelling that if we just, you know, practice evidence-based medicine and stop doing unnecessary tests, then our economy was going to be saved and our patients were going to be healthier. And um, so I, I really, you know, drank that Kool-Aid, um, as it were. And then, and then I, I don't quite know what happened. I think probably a lot of it was actually just learning more cardiology, actually being behind the scenes and understanding how decisions were being made about resource use. And then finally, I think beginning to grasp in a way that I hadn't when I was just doing more general medicine, sort of the complexity of medical decision making. And, you know, stents are like a really interesting example of that. Um, 
in so far as you know, we all know that for patients in the throes of an acute MI, stents are appropriate, but then there's this whole debate about um, when the use of PCI is appropriate for patients with more, you know, stable coronary artery disease. And um, I'm, do you want me to keep talking? Right. Or? No. So let me. But you're not saying, and that's clear from the beginning of your your essay. And we'll have it. Uh, you know, we'll have a link to it, obviously, on the on the show notes. Um, you're not saying that there's no way. There's obviously a lot of waste. I mean, if, if there's something that most of us can agree on, and I think most everybody agrees on, is how much waste there seems to be, or there is, not, not seems to be. Right. There is. And um, a key concept which you just mentioned is the concept of unnecessary care or unnecessary uh, diagnostic, uh, you know, testing, unnecessary testing, unnecessary care, unnecessary treatment. And we'll come back to that, of course. Um, but, but it's funny, um, is because you know, so it, it's a very compelling narrative to say there's so much unnecessary care because everybody agrees, and and you're right. Uh, uh, the the the, the um, it's also compelling to think that if we practice according to quote unquote the evidence, then we can get rid of a lot of the unnecessary care, uh, and and uh, and waste and. Um, and so, but but there's always a but, but but there's more nuance to to this, and um, and you you start talking about at least in the paper you start talking about uh, you know trade-offs that one must you know must think of uh, or think about um, when when you do you know if you're routinely going to do less, um, it's likely going to come at a cost. Um, and so uh, a concept that you, you start um, uh, highlighting and, and talking about and, and um, critiquing a little bit is this concept of overdiagnosis uh, that's you know, frequently mentioned in the, in the context of, um, of, um, uh, of these debates or, or of these calls to arm, arms to, uh, to get rid of, of waste. What it, what's overdiagnosis? Uh, because it's not actually a very straightforward concept uh, and people can be uh, uh, fooled about about the term right so you can you can feel free to uh, chime in if, if I'm not you know defining it as uh, well as I could but I, in my mind overdiagnosis is this concept of diagnosing um, a disease that would never be clinically relevant so for instance um, Ductal carcinoma in C2 is, is a good example of, you know, something that we diagnose all the time, but might never cause the woman uh, morbidity or mortality. Right. So that's, a, that's for breast cancer. It's a, it's a kind of um, breast cancer you do on a biopsy. Uh, you find it on a biopsy. And it's technically it might it fulfill the criteria for carcinoma or for cancer. But in terms of its natural history, it's, it seems to be completely benign or you know, for the most part, right? Right. But I think the key, the key point for me about overdiagnosis is it's only something that you can understand in retrospect. That's right. So I think that that's just like such a key point that gets lost so often in, in discussions about overdiagnosis. Um, nobody mm -hmm. walks around your life be saying, you know, oh, I've, I've been overdiagnosed. It's, it's something we only know after the fact. And not only in retrospect, also uh, in the aggregate, you can only know about it from doing population studies. That's right. Um, you, you can say, you know, you can have a cohort of people who, uh, you know, who are diagnosed and maybe for, you know, for whatever reason you, you, you ignore the diagnosis or you don't do what normally the diagnosis would compel you to do and that sort of thing. And you realize that their outcome, outcomes are just fine. And, uh, and on the aggregate, you can say that there's overdiagnosis in many aspects of medicine, breast cancer, cardiology, you know, this and that. Um, but that's very different from saying that you can identify it uh, on the fly in any given patient. Right, exactly. And I, mean, I think that that's the whole like, premise of this idea of eliminating waste, you know, is based on this assumption of predictability. And in the absence of that predictability, the idea that just you know heating the evidence means that we're going to spend less and have healthier patients is, is probably pretty false. Um, and I'm not sure why that gets so lost in the in the conversation. 
because it's, it's so critical. You know, every day, if we all had a crystal ball, then sure, we could use fewer resources, but that's not how we practice. Right. Uh, Anish, do you have something to say? Because I'm about to yeah. go on, uh, on my soapbox here. About the, <laughs> the, the <laughs> yeah, the, so the, the, but I, I want to stay on the, on the concept, on the, the idea of diagnosis. So if you're, if you're going to move beyond the, the question of diagnosis, let me finish. Yeah, no, I, I thought, the, I thought, you know, the, the piece was the piece was excellent in terms of uh, bringing out exactly what you're talking about in terms of how do we how do we go about reducing waste? Um, it seems that the same folks that um, uh, have uh, some very strong opinions in terms of what evidence we need to do something uh, don't have the same bars of evidence in terms of how we go about reducing something. Lisa, your your piece, uh, the piece was. Um, uh, do you do you think? I guess the counter to or at least some people make make the counter argument that there's such a, a massive amount of waste. It should be really easy to uh, figure out um, where the um, holes are in the system. So locally in the community you have a sense of where waste is. Do you think, is there some easy solution that we're missing in terms of how to go about um, fixing overuse? No. Overdiagnosis? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's what is so fascinating to me about the narrative. the narrative. The narrative argues for simplicity. If it were simple, then we wouldn't have this problem. It's not like everyone practicing medicine is, is not smart, you know? So I, I think that that's, that's what's always been so so bizarre to me about it, and and what's so interesting as you watch this like push for value based payments and ACOs. Um, I think that we're going to find that um, you know eliminating waste is actually way more fraught than than had been initially imagined, um, and I'm not even sure that we can define much of the time what waste even means. And part of that gets into this overdiagnosis issue. Part of that is because, you know, what's meaningful to people um, is very different and often immeasurable. Yeah, that's right. And I think so. Um, the point I, w I want I want to make here is that there's a misconception, um, even among many most doctors. I think um, they don't practice that way. But but if 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 you ask them to articulate, they may articulate wrongly what a diagnosis is. Uh, the misconception is this, is that the diagnosis is discovered. You know, it's something out there in the, in, the, in the patient, and your job is to discover it, and then you find it, and then you act upon it. But really, that's, that doesn't hold. It's a very mechanical view of, of what a you know, health and diagnosis is. Uh, it, it's as if, you know, you have, you, you, you have a blueprint, and then you go in the patient, and you find what, where the error is or where the deviation is. You make the diagnosis that way. And then you take care of the problem, but a diagnosis is not um, is not discovered. It's actually and, and we use the expression all the time. We say making a diagnosis, right? So diagnoses are made. They're made on the fly because they are clinical judgments. We we actually the, it's the decision of the doctor that that makes the <coughs> diagnosis, um, which is very interesting because at the same time we can't say that it's completely subjective. It's not it's not you know the, the whims of the doctor you know, that, that uh, determine the diagnosis. But, but there's a very important uh, aspect of, of, uh, of, of the, the clinician making a judgment and saying, I want to call this hypothyroidism, or I want to call this myocardial infarction, you know, based on the information that I have. But there's nothing in the information that itself, you know, makes, you know, the diagnosis. It's always, it has to be a judgment. From doctor, mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. You know, hypothyroidism, it's, it's a simple one because you can say, well, how do you make the diagnosis of hypothyroidism? Well, if the TSH is high, right, if the TSH is beyond the normal value, then you have hypothyroidism. But that's not true. Uh, and we know that in practice. We know, we, know, um, we know, for example, that the upper limits of value for the TSH is, is only, um, you know, two standard deviations from, from the norm. So you could be a little bit above five and still be normal if, if we're going to adopt the bell-shaped curve uh, uh, model, right? That's number one. Number two, there are people who dispute where, the, you know, that 
where that limit is, you know, that upper limit of normal. So they say, well, I don't think it's five. I think people can be hypothyroid even at four or whatnot. Or you can have people with a, a super high TSH who are actually normal, right? They, I, I've had a case, uh, it, it was really fascinating to, a couple of years ago, one of my patients who had been completely stable on her thyroid medication, all of a sudden she came in, her TSH was 60. And I thought, oh my God, this is, I repeated it and it was still 60, 70, extremely high. Clinically, she was completely fine. Um, and it turns out what it was, it was obviously, it was, a, it was a, f a false positive in that case because she was taking biotin or some other supplement which interfered with the assay. And interestingly, it interfered in a way that's contrary to how we think biotin interferes. A at any rate, you, you can't really say, you, you can't really use anything objective to make the diagnosis. At some point, you have to make a decision. You're going to say this. Same thing with myocardial infarction. What is a myocardial infarction? You cannot say, oh, it's going to have to be if you fulfill this criteria, you know. No, the, the criteria give you some kind of, uh, you know, some, some basis on which you make a diagnosis. But at the end of the day, a diagnosis is always made by a clinician in a specific situation for a given patient at a given moment in time. And baked in the decision to make a diagnosis is the prognosis or what difference is going to make or what, what difference you think it's going to make in the future for that person. And if you anticipate that making the diagnosis is going to be helpful in a certain way, then you may be more likely to make it. And, and that's, so there are many other sort of factors that, that mm -hmm. you know, are, are baked in. But otherwise, we tend, um, and certainly I think the public tends to uh, think about diagnosis. Health policy people tend to think about diagnosis primarily as a matter of blueprint. So you, you find you have the recipe. If you, if you, if you don't meet so, you know, the criteria, then it's over diagnosis or whatnot and that sort of but, thing. But let's get to, let's get to you know, an excellent point Lisa brought up in the article, is, which is that the less is more narrative and the less is more movement is very, very strong, right? It, it um, you know, uh, folks that are big time uh, users of the less is more narrative, you know, there's stuff that appears in New York Times and, and editorials, they have thousands of followers on, uh, on, on Twitter and social media. So, Lisa, wh what do you think? And, and you discuss you discuss this in your um, in your uh, essay under uh, you know oversimplification. And uh, uh, I was hoping you could go into why you think it's such a um, appealing narrative. Why do people like it so much? Yeah. So that was a huge part about of why I wrote it because it sort of yeah. gets at like the two two questions that fascinate me most in life. One of them is why do we tell the stories we tell? And the other is, why do we do what we do as physicians? I mean, as humans too, it's interesting, but really as physicians. And so in terms of narratives about medicine, I think that, that the narratives that hold appeal are those that, um, you know, they have features of good and evil, which this one does. I mean, it's sort of like greedy physicians who are sort of, you know, doing too many things and hurting patients and decimating our economy in the process. They tend to seek you know, cause and effect, sometimes where cause and effect doesn't exist. And again, in this case, it's sort of that, you know, greed is driving overuse. Um, and I think that they, like, because medicine is so um, hard to understand and medical decision-making is so hard to understand, um, it's, it's a very compelling narrative because it eliminates trade-offs. And I think that that's something that is just so appealing to people who, I mean, that, you know, healthcare is obviously such a huge part of our economy and so many people are emotionally invested in it. So this idea that we could have an answer that doesn't require us to have to give up anything is just so appealing. Right. And, and it's, and, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. You speak. I'd rather you speak. <laughs> yeah, no, no, and you also, you also talk about, and I, I hope uh, this is the second, uh, the other part you, uh, uh, you talk about is, uh, at some of what Danny Kahneman has said, correct? Um, where you talk about, you know, our confidence in a story's accuracy reflects not an evaluation of the reliability of the evidence and its quality, but rather the coherence of the story. So the idea, you know, as you're touching on is that, you know, the more coherent the story is, the more willing we are to, we, we, uh, willing we are to uh, uh, believe it. Um, so, so, you know, so the persuas persuasiveness of the less is more movement in large part, you know, relates to the fact that it is so simple. Um, and as you know, medicine is so incredibly complex with so many moving parts. It's much easier to kind of rely on these uh, simple, um, simple narratives. Um, 
Yeah, but, but one, one aspect I think that uh, Lisa mentions at the beginning of the essay is that not only is it simple, but it's actually, it's, it's an answer to the fact that the healthcare system is terrible, right? I mean, people are un unhappy. You say that, you know, in a country where confidence in medical leaders has waned precipitously, which is true, right? There's a lot of, uh, th there's a trust crisis. Right. There's a trust right. crisis. These indictments, you know, the indictments from the less is more movement, you know, that there's, you know, so much waste and so forth and, and whatnot, channel or may channel a general disenchantment with the healthcare system. Right. And I think that's true. People are unhappy. Everybody's unhappy. Patients are unhappy. Doctors are unhappy. Right. You know, there's and, and it's, a, it's so it's a narrative that um, is not only simple and coherent, but it also serves a purpose, uh, a general social purpose. Right. Would you say, Lisa, there's uh, you know, there's so the other the other part is that the uh, frequently the way it's framed in the popular press is um, as the less is more narrative is kind of let it's it's believed to be unbiased <laughs> is that is that what, what do you think about that lisa do you think the less is more do you think folks that are less is more advocates that are frequently quoted in the new york times and wherever else do you find them to be uh, unbiased? no <laughs> is that a leading question no i think it's a huge irony right because i mean this is so fascinating to me and always has been because you know, financial biases are so identifiable and so easy to measure. And that plays so much into this, right? Because because greed is seen as the motivating force. I mean, I, I think if you kind of can get to the core of what I find most interesting about all of this is that, and, and I sort of got to it at the end of the essay, is this idea that position avarice is, is what's driving overuse. And it, it assumes um, that we understand why we behave the way we do, and it assumes that there, you know, that we deal with uncertainty in this uniform way, and, and or or that when we when we make decisions that end up, you know, using resources in a way that didn't lead to greater health benefit, it was, you know, to earn some extra money. And I just think that, you know, this happens because we can always find examples of this, and because we can measure those examples. But this idea that at this point in time, obviously, there are a lot of people who are very passionate in this belief about eliminating waste. And I, and I suspect, you know, I can only um, speculate about how powerful of a bias that engenders. But I, I think that I think you, you're right. We all know there are people who are very prominent in medicine who are, you know, therape therapeutic nihilists, essentially. And... Um, they they often get a lot of press coverage, and you know it's it's a it really fuels I think um, this this narrative, and it's it's problematic. And I, I talked about it a little bit in the piece, but that we don't have a good way of you know flagging that bias like we can flag. You yeah. Know, you know, so we, how do you have, if you can't? So some would say that if you can't measure something, it doesn't exist. This is actually something what do you i mean so how, how do we go about you know how, how does one go about discussing or how does one go about highlighting i mean you you're you were you know obviously you're an essay but we live in a world of where everything needs to be measured and quantified right so yeah. do, do you think that the answer is that we need to um start uh, um coming up with ways to measure um passion these not <laughs> yes measure passion <laughs> so i I've thought about this a lot because it, you're right. It seems to be like the antidote to all this is to say, okay, well, I'm going to figure out a way to measure your intellectual conflict based on, you know, how many articles you've published on this topic, how many times you've been quoted in the New York Times about this topic. But, like, there's something so fundamentally human and also wonderful about being passionate about something, right? So, like, you don't want to go down this road of starting to quantify everything in a way that, suggest that we shouldn't be passionate about what we do because that's how all of us, you know, find purpose in life. Right. But I think that there has to be some middle ground. I think you're, I think that the pendulum has swung way too far toward if you can't measure it, it's meaningless. And, you know, that's like, that is in a way, of, you know, sort of a, um, for me, that's like a good thing to say because it like suggests there's a role for essay writing and things like that. <laughs> but I mean, I do believe that. I think that the way to counter some of this is to be able to have a discussion about it. Now, that's, that's sort of a cop-out answer. And what would really be useful, of course, is if we could have a, a discussion that is less polarized. And I think like the, the big challenge around this is that the passions run so high 
that, um, you know, it's, it's very hard to have a discussion that ends up being more clarifying than um, clouding. Right. L let me explore a little bit more the, the connection with the, um, the question of measurement. And you alluded to earlier about the evidence-based medicine movement. Uh, because, you know, they will say, but listen, uh, okay, perhaps measurement is not the end-all be-all of everything, but whenever we measure, lo and behold, you know, we find that whatever you thought was helpful is actually not helpful, right? Uh, lo and behold, stents don't uh, decrease mortality in stable angi angina. Lo and behold, uh, screening mammography doesn't save women, uh, you know, lives. Lo and behold, uh, you know, PCI doesn't reduce angina. This, and, and, and therefore they say, look, I mean, you know, it, the onus is on the people who, who want to introduce stuff to, uh, to prove that it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then and then we can uh, you know use it and uh, and then we'll we'll have evidence. So what what do we say uh, to that? I mean, I I only I, I you know more about this than I do. I mean, I follow these arguments you know a little bit on Twitter, but to me the flip side is obviously you know the other extreme where you have a patient in shock should you use an impella. You have to have a randomized trial to be able to 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 take that step and how could you establish clinical equipoise, you know, at, at this juncture, I think that's a very compelling argument. And that, you know, if you, if you really presented this to the public in a, in a way that engages them in the sort of nuts and bolts of, of decision making, I think we could have a very rich conversation about the burden of, edi the burden of evidence that really ought to be required for using quote unquote life saving interventions. Of course, people would say, well, you don't know that they're life saving. But I, I mean, obviously, that's the dilemma, right? Right. I, I, I agree. And I would say also that there are, you know, th th there's a conflation of, of different things. Um, first of all, um, when, when there's a clinical trial, you know, let's say that people do a certain practice and then there's a clinical trial that comes up and says that, well, you know, the, the practice is not as helpful as we thought that it was uh, to begin with. You know, it's easy to go say, aha, you know, we told you so, you were wasting all this time. But before the clinical trial was, was available, there was, you know, uh, there was, you know, in a sense, there was no evidence and people, you, you couldn't have called that wasteful. You know, the science wasn't there and people well, were doing what they thought was, was best, right? So, well, so, so there's an argument to be, you know, people can be a sort of uh, Monday morning quarterbacks or the less is more, you know, may have a tendency to do that in a way. Um, number two, there's also that question of um, um, uh, what is, you know, the, the value, uh, and you, you talk about this also, you know, the, the value of an intervention, of, of, of a treatment or an intervention or a diagnosis, um, you know, inherently has a lot of, uh, Subjectivity, and you can have, let me, you know, I can come up with a scenario. Let's, have, let's say you have Mr. Smith, right? And he goes, see, he, you know, he sees Dr. Brown, and I'm using the, the last name Brown as a generic. I'm not thinking about any specific Dr. Brown here. Uh, but he sees, you know, uh, Dr. Brown for his coronary disease, and he receives medical therapy, okay? And imagine a parallel universe where the same Mr. Smith goes to see Dr. Stone, and instead of getting medical therapy, he gets a stent. It's not clear to me that even with all the information that we have, and now we've had clinical trials ad nauseum, that either approach is necessarily bad or wrong, or, or uh, regardless, uh, regardless of what the outcomes are at the end. You know, I mean, I can see that it's perfectly reasonable for Smith to get treated with, by medical therapy by Dr. Brown, and for Smith to be treated with a stent by Dr. Stone. Um, well, I think and the I, have, I have nothing to right. There's, they're both. You know, they might be equally valuable. Uh, there's nothing objectively that uh, that I can point to that says that one is obviously wrong, even if the clinical trials for stents are, you know, negative. Uh, you know, on, on yeah. Well, the problem articles. here is that Dr. Brown, who is treating for medical therapy, G generic Dr. Brown, right? Generic I'm not Dr. talking Brown. about anyone in not, particular, right? Exactly. <laughs> uh, any any relation to any true characters right. is purely uh, <laughs> coincidence. The problem is that Dr. Brown believes Dr. Stone is uh, is is greedy and uh, is performing uh, outside of the uh, acceptable range. 
Um, so you know that that's the that's the issue. Um, so how how does one get how does one get the Dr. Browns of the world to understand that variation may happen and variation is a part of life and um, not necessarily a, a marker of overuse or egregious activity or that. Right. But yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> and that it's not a, you know not necessarily any of his business uh, to 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 police right to be the policeman of, of medical care everywhere. Right. I mean, I do think though you raise this, and I don't know how to talk about this without sounding, you know, there's, it's a little bit cliche at this point, but I mean, I, I actually sincerely believe that so much of what we do, you know, the value of it, quote unquote value, you know, comes down to what it means to the, to the patient and how the patient understands um, the treatment approach. And so, I mean, I, I, I like firmly believe in evidence-based medicine, but obviously there are still all these areas of gray. And so I think that what we haven't done as a medical community, I mean, we talk about shared decision-making, we talk about decision aids, but we have a very elementary understanding of how patients perceive risk and how emotions sort of collide with perceptions of risk. So I, I like to believe that, it, you know, the next decade as we sort of, we, we we have so much data at our disposal now. I think the next frontier has to be, you know, better understanding how to make those data meaningful to people, both to doctors and patients, so that you know that you can make decisions about you know whether or not to get a stent when you have table angina. Um, right. Although I would say that you know, good clinicians today have essentially, you know, already have that understanding. And that's what distinguishes a good clinician, in my mind, from a bad one. Uh, even though we, you know we may not articulate it, or the, the clinician may not articulate it, but a, a same doctor may, for a patient with the exact same objective characteristics, decide, well, okay, for you, I'm going to recommend that you get you know your your screening mammogram, or you get this, or you get that your PA, you know, and and for the exact same. I mean, not the exact same person, but for a person with sort of similar objective characteristics, say, you know, I don't think in this case that I, I, I want to go down that down that route. So a doctor doesn't have to, uh, you know, as I said, I mean, you know, I go back to sort of my my original point. It's, it's not mechanical. The practice of medicine is not mechanical. It's not regimented well, by no, but I, by engineering uh, considerations of, of uh, no. But I think Lisa's saying that over time our crystal ball may get better, which it has, right? It, has, it is certainly the case that before echocardiography there were patients that went to the operating room that had their valves fixed that probably didn't need their valves fixed. And that over time, as we had better abilities to discriminate who has severe valvular disease um, with echocardiography, PT, you know, the ability to see flay leaflets, et cetera, that, um, that, you know, we can better distinguish who can and cannot go to the OR just in the same way for stents for stable CAD. It certainly may be possible. I, I keep, I've been hearing about this vulnerable plaque for 30 years. Um, um, and <laughs> at some point, if we figure out where, where, where these vulnerable plaques are and uh, if we can uh, prophylactically stent them, then, then, you know, we may improve our discriminati discriminatory powers. I'm not saying that we're placing stents now in order to necessarily prevent heart attacks, et cetera, but, but, um, but I, think that, I think that's the point. Is that, is that, would that be fair, Lisa? Is that what you're suggesting? Well, yeah, I mean, I think our predictive capabilities are going to increase that. I mean, we're never going to eliminate uncertainty. Right. What I'm saying right. is that, like, we ought to spend more time as a profession, given that none of, you know, none of our data are absolute. There, there's yeah. always room for judgment yeah. and figuring out how to meld that aspect of judgment with sort of better understanding what the patient wants and, and how the patient's understanding the data we have. And, right. um, I think that I think Mikhail, what you're saying is that like that, you know, the best clinicians like just sort of intuit this naturally. And I think you're probably right. But I think we should spend a lot more time. I mean, I guess part of the point of the article to to get back to it is to say, okay, look, there are so many reasons we do what we do. We need to invest a lot more as a medical community to figure out why we do what we do rather than assuming it's just about greed. And if there are motivational forces that are causing us, you know, to do things that cause harm, then we need to address those. But we should approach that as scientifically as we approach anything else. So, 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 so you're not saying as there's some. So I think some critics uh, at the time, I recall, said that 
you're you're not saying that we should take a, a status quo approach. You're not, you're not necessarily defending the status quo to say we should continue to uh, uh, continue on our egregious overuse uh, path. No, it's funny to me that that was what was suggested. Um, so that that is not true. <laughs> um, but I, I mean, I think we have a tremendous amount to learn. I just think that the profession, um, you know, we we have a way of learning in medicine, which is again the, the sort of the RCT is the gold standard. But I think part of what interests me, and always part of why I write, is because there's there's so much to understand about the human mind and psychology and decision making and risk risk perception, which is so inherent to what we do that that we don't really understand. We haven't thought about it in a sophisticated way. And if, if we could better study, you know, physician behavior, um, then I think that that we could approach these questions a little more um, rigorously rather than just in terms like. Uh, right. I'm going to push right. back. Let me push oh. back on this. Let me, oh. let me <laughs> let's make this one. I, I can't imagine any kind of empirical study of the human psychology and blah, blah, blah. That's. <laughs> That's really going to to really change uh, the the problem. Uh, the problem, really, as far as I'm concerned, is Nassim when we try speaks. to to make medicine. Uh, you know, medicine is being practiced, and you know, the elephant in the room, as far as I'm concerned, is the fact that it's being paid for by third parties, which necessarily makes medical care impersonal. The essence of medicine is a personal relationship. I mean, that's that's the bottom line. And then you'll have good doctors, as I mentioned earlier, you know, who will judge well, who will have a good sense, an intuitive sense of psychology, because it has to be intuitive. They cannot go and say, you know, I've I've studied, you know, books of you know of psychological testing, and you know, on average, the human beings act in this way, and therefore I'm gonna, you know, you have a, another human being in front of you, and it's completely, you know, there's irre irreducible uncertainty. There's irreducible uncertainty. Uh, but but the doctor can have a sense of where things are, are, are going. You know, I mean, it's a, it's a life in motion in front of you, and you have to have a sense of where that motion is going and how you're going to intervene and how your intervention is going to alter the motion of the patient's life in front of you. And you make the best, uh, you know, uh, the, the best de decision that you can. And somehow we seem to be able to recognize good doctors from bad doctors. You know, it's it's interesting how how we can do that, even though. None of this can be really articulated in any way that lends itself to uh, scientific study or at least empirical scientific study. So we can we can we can do that, and 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 we were I think we were doing it a lot better, and and there was a lot of more trust in medicine before we made it so impersonal, before it's become such an impersonal uh, enterprise. So I. Um, you know, I say no, no. Let's not wait for for you know future psychological you know. Insight. I mean, I'm not saying that there can't be any good insights from from uh, from uh, you know from scientific uh, studies of human beings. I mean, you know, th there can be, but uh, a lot of it has to do with with just uh, let's just make it more personal. Let's just let people, you know, be responsible for one another and and so forth. And all right, I'm getting off my soapbox. No, here. no, no. <laughs> I mean, I fundamentally so agree with you that like the relationship is the essence of it, and we move so far away from that but i don't think that takes away from the fact that like to get back there we have to better understand sort of the system-wide factors that cause people to maybe use resources or make decisions in a way that are you know not the best for the patient so like if we're asking people to see patients in a 15-minute visit and it's way easier to order a stress test than to sit and have a discussion about what the chest pain is really like or you know that when it occurs and with exercise or whatever, then people, you know, are going to be ordering more stress tests. And so I guess that's what I mean in terms of, you know, better understanding because we can, we can address those. If we have, I mean, medicine moves from data, you know, so we can address those factors if we can study that. And I, I think that alone is a case for doing it. All right. Yeah. I, the, I think I'll, I'll I'll grant you that. <laughs> <laughs> the 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 um, but it's interesting. That Michelle talked about you know third party. Br Michelle of course brought up third party payment, um, uh, but you know less is more in some cases driven by the idea that uh, the system is corrupt because of how payment incentives are for providers, right? So, right. so I mean I think so. The, you know the, the, their their argument is that. The less is more movement is a responsive 
uh, it's, it's kind of a corrective uh, sort of uh, uh, motion to a system that is massively um, attempting to incentivize overuse. So, right. uh, so I mean, Lisa, do, do you think that I mean, does the medical industrial academic complex, does it exist? I, I think, so I think this is where, you know, I tend, this is where I, I get a lot of criticism. Like, I think you can say that both, that it exists, that financial incentives are real, that they motivate behavior. And it's also true that lots of other things motivate behavior too. And that, you know, some physicians, you know, may not be motivated by financial incentives at all. And even those physicians who are, are motivated by other things. But again, the, oh, go ahead. Is, do you think, is the less is more movement correct in saying that, okay, fine, there's all these other different things, but but the financial incentives, the, the, the uh, avarice of uh, physicians is far and away the biggest, most easily tac tackleable uh, uh, thing. Like, should we, you know, does, does any attempt to minimize the fact that there are other, uh, sorry, to, to bring up the fact that there are other biases, um, uh, does that diminish going after this particular thing that they think is the elephant in the room and they think is the most important thing? Meaning, when you say, you know, when you write your piece or when you're saying whatever, uh, what you're saying right now, uh, are you minimizing... Um, yeah, they certainly make that claim. I mean, you've been attacked after this. Uh, just, just, you know, to tell the audience who haven't, you know, followed this story, but you, you've been attacked and you, you frequently get attacked uh, when you write these, you know, your, your essays uh, for taking the positions that you take because um, uh, that's right. That's, so, so Anish is correct. That the, the claim is that because you've been more nuanced and comprehensive, you're, you're distracting from the mission of the less is more movement. You're, you're torpedoing and therefore you're playing into the hands of the enemy. Right, so specifically, it's, it's, they say that, look, this is a much, much bigger issue. So are you, are you saying, Lisa, that you think that the issues that they're raising are much smaller than what they think they are? I think nobody knows. But I, just, I think to, to say on one level, like we should only do things that are evidence-based, and on another, that mm. greed is the foremost factor driving physician behavior is a complete contradiction because we don't have data to say relative to what, relative to what other influence. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. You're, you're, and, and they make there's you know the the statements that they make are so obvious to them that they're completely blind to their own, uh, to their own biases and and the lack of evidence uh, that they have to to hold the positions that they have. Um, this is great. That's the danger of the half truth because the less is more movement, uh, you know, contains an important half truth. I mean, it's it's. I think they're correct. You know, in this, there are incentives for physicians to do more and spend more and waste more and so forth. And we all recognize that and we, uh, we see it happening. But half-truths are really very, they're the worst of the fallacies. The fallacy of the half-truth is really the, the most dangerous one um, because it precisely allows you to go on, on this, uh, this rampage, uh, convinced that, 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 that you're in the right. And um, and so, so, yeah. Go ahead, Anish. So you you ended um, you, you you ended your piece with an with a personal anecdote. Yeah. About um, an illness that you know some mystery illness that you had, and the specialist you saw, or or I forget the primary care. I forget who it's primary care or specialist. Not that it matters. Some physician that you saw had recommended uh, an invasive test. And, yes. and 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 you interestingly were perfectly comfortable with the with saying no I don't want this test I don't think it's needed yes there's uncertainty but I'm 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 comfortable with the uncertainty right but in the end of the day you actually went ahead with the test why did you go ahead with the test because because she told me she wouldn't be able to live with herself if I didn't get it and I my 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 heart in the end went out to her <laughs> yeah you so, want to have a good relationship right I mean it's yeah. it's a relationship issue but, yeah. but you're talking about should so should patients so you're saying patients role is to satisfy their doctors <laughs> no I mean in this instance though obviously it gave me insight because I know when I'm in the role of doctor I feel the same and I deal with it you know by trying to you know very clearly articulate uncertainty to patients and try to navigate their comfort level with it because I don't want my discomfort with uncertainty to take their care necessarily. Right. 
So and it's such a dynamic thing because it can change from moment to moment, right? I mean, under di different circumstances, a few months later, let me finish, or a few, <laughs> or a few months earlier, you, you might have been more resistant to go along with, with your doctor's recommendation, right? I mean, it's very dynamic. And, and that's the nature of relationships is that they, they, they change all the time. You know, the, the, the content of the relationship changes. Go ahead, yeah. Anisha. But, but, put, put, but, but let's, uh, the three of us are, are, are all physicians, but let's, let's pretend that we are not physicians and that we are looking at this story from another context, right? Uh, the context of, my God, the system is set up to just do more, 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 right? right. When, you, when, you re when you read that, that personal anecdote um, and you see that, you know, you as a super smart cardiologist at, uh, at, um, at, at one of the right. Harvard places <laughs> is... Uh, is uh, uh brigham sorry is um actually going going along with it just to satisfy the physician and uh, this uh, uh, that reflects a fundamental problem a systemic problem with the system is that a fair is that is that is that fair that that, is that a fair? Uh, it's a human nature problem i think more than a system problem and and i think that's where i'm most cynical about how we're going to fix this i mean so one option obviously is to just sort of have like caps on what we can do, right? Right, and exactly. Like, exactly. Circumstances that this would never be appropriate. Right. But I don't think that would have been true in this instance. Like it was probably an appropriate test to order. I just thought it was unnecessary. Yeah, but, but right. But, uh, but Lisa, what if you had to pay for it? You know, what if it cost $1,500? Yes, and and you, you, you know, up. right. <laughs> right, right. So, I mean, so these are the tough uh, questions. But that's a, systemic, that's a systemic question because there are systems where you would have to pay for the cost of the care. Right, and, and, and I probably that would have been the the deciding factor for me at yeah, this point. Yeah, which which is what what really prices are supposed to to do. They they're supposed to help you decide the value of of uh, of an action. So, so this is exactly what I was getting to, Michelle. You've fallen into my trap. <laughs> so I was, I was going to get to exactly this was that was that you know the decision that Lisa made was made uh, without because she didn't have to pay for it or had to pay a very small amount for it. I didn't have to bear the total cost of it that, you know, you're like, okay, fine, I'll just go ahead. And that's part of the point that the less is more movement is making, except they're making it from a very different place than what Michelle is making it. And what, as Lisa touched on, you know, they, I think they envision a, a world where you have, you know, Autobots making decisions by strict criteria about who will and who will not get a colonoscopy. Right. And so they would, they would limit it greatly in terms of, they would limit the physician greatly in terms of what it is they could order. Um, yeah, but Michelle comes from it from the other angle in terms of, well, you know, that's the, the, the decision should be made uh, with the idea that the patient uh, carries the full burden of the true cost of the procedure. Um, Whatever that right, cost, although you you couch it in very to. very uh, harsh terms, I mean, I say, you know you can say the person you know the per the patient and uh, his or her personal entourage. You know I I like to add that or 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 community. You know because it can be the family, it can be the, the 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 voluntary community that supports the patient. It can be a lot of things in addition to just the patient, the uh, you know individual patient. Whenever but you're right. In fact, that's where, you know, Lisa, maybe that's where I would like psychological research to, to, to come into play here uh, in, in how, how important it is for, for us to have prices to be able to make good, good decisions. Uh, I mean, I have very mixed feelings on this, too, and they're not grounded in solid economic theory. Yeah, so, right. I mean, but economic I, theory is not grounded in solid theory either. So, well, I, there pro I know there's tons of research on about this. You know, they could give you a more informed answer. My concern, I, I've actually written about this before too, is in terms of like knowing how much your healthcare costs is. That you know, first of all, prices assume far more salience for those who have less money. So that alone is something that, is something that concerns me. But also, I think it's like you know, this idea that more information is always better is, is like something that we can't back away from at this point. Um, but I think there are some data to suggest, you know, for instance, like if you're looking for a high quality hospital, if you give people, you know, a few uh, fewer pieces of information, they're able to make a better decision about which hospital to seek than if you give them more. And I think you know, when you start introducing prices into the mix, like this is a totally taboo thing to say because it sounds like you're being anti-transparency, but I think that there 
are so it ignites so many emotions in people and and really it prices are so familiar to us that it, when that becomes part of a conversation it becomes very hard not to focus on cost as opposed to all these other things that matter and making a decision about you're right it's very difficult because it you, you know it assumes that the current system the way it is is you know reflect that the costs have any kind of you know meaning right now which which they don't and that's that's a problem um it's a problem it's, it's very very difficult to do but to go back to what anisha's you know i mean anisha i'm gonna um, give it back to you in a second but you were you were saying that the less is more movements assumption you know they, they assume that they can um do away with with the the problem of scarcity by having rules that they themselves design because the less is more are primarily academics right so they want to design the rules of how we allocate uh, healthcare resources to everybody so they want to be in charge of the decisions and they can they think that they can you know deal with the problem of scarcity that way or optimize it in a certain way as opposed to my my uh, my view which is that's impossible it's it's a, it's a, it's a folly and that the problem of scarcity is inevitable that poor people in general are going to be worse off i mean that's the meaning of of poverty and uh and if you know, if you were poor, but you know, you could have all the healthcare you want and all the food you want, and you know, then you wouldn't be poor. So, so poor are going to be uh, the problem of poverty is is um, is dealt with, you know, locally with you know through communities taking care of their own poor people and helping them out with sort of uh, with knowledge of who they are personally, because you know there are some people who make bad decisions and continue to make bad bad decisions, and they have to. I mean, one way of learning your lessons is to to be responsible, you know, for for the costs of your decisions. Uh, so, so, yeah, go ahead. So I'll say that, M M Michelle, whenever we start talking about this, Michelle always <laughs> relies on this beautiful community that, that I don't know where it exists. Maybe it's San it, Francisco. It, yeah, Maybe it's no, it, it exists. Well, it, 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 everyone takes care of everyone else. And Yeah, I, I, but, I'll, I'll give you historical question, examples uh, of it. Yeah. My question to Lisa and Michelle, Lisa first, though, is, is um, uh, do you see physicians as the stewards of uh, of uh, uh, of healthcare resources do you think that's a role that we should play I, I think i'm reading between the lines that you're saying uh, lisa you're saying that no that's not something that we should be we should be uh, uh, feeling oh i think i'm confused about your question so i mean i think that um so healthcare resources are scarce and should we be should we be uh, playing the role of steward of scarce healthcare resources I don't see how we can't. I mean, I, I think that um, it would be pretty naive to act as if physicians are not, you know, playing a critical role in determining um, how much resources are used, but that does not then mean that overuse is only because of physician greed. And I think that's where like the, the line of reasoning falls off. So surely we play a role, surely we have to think about our role and and understand it better and understand what we can do better but that doesn't mean that everything that's gone awry in the system is is because the physicians have been using it in a screening manner Does right but but what what um when uh, anisha uses the term steward it means that i mean of course we are determinant we, we determine in a way because we're involved and we you know we use the the pen and uh, as you said in your piece the pen you know the the all the dodge the pen is the most but to be a steward meaning to make a decision on the basis of how much is going to cost, not only not to the patient, obviously, although you know perhaps partly, but but to the third parties in general. So, do, like, do so we have to to keep that in mind or or be mindful of that. I mean, are you asking me should physicians be making the decisions about how healthcare resources are allocated, like for society? Well, well, no, from an individual labor, from a patient. So let me give you an, let me give you uh, both an example, right? So you have a okay. patient with an LDL of um, of uh, 85 that you've been following for four years. They have a coronary calcium score of 150, with you know the calcium you know is located mostly in the uh, mid LAD. I don't know whether that matters or not. It doesn't matter. But <laughs> they have a calcium score of 100, and you've been managing the person um, with Lipitor. They're on Lipitor 40 with a LDL of, uh, of like I said, uh, 85. Um, they come to you, they come to you now and you know, the Odyssey trial, uh, the PCSK9 inhibitor trial has just uh, hit, hit the, uh, you know, hit about a couple months ago, the new lipid guidelines are out and the new lipid guidelines are saying, you know what, uh, LDL of 100, you know, was a goal, LDL of 70 for your high risk people was a goal, but now don't use 70 as a goal, you know, it can be even lower because 
you know, the, the, the recent PCSK9 trials suggest there's a benefit seen even if you get lower than that. Um, so now, you know, this person that you were f perfectly happy with an LDL of 85, now there's a guideline out there that suggests, hey, maybe we should get to even less than 85 to reduce uh, events. Now, and the problem for the audience, the, uh, the PCSK9 costs like $10,000 a year or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's about yeah cash or something. It's like, it used to be, and they, they've cut prices recently. I mean, it used to be $1,000 a month um, approximately, right? Um, and so the question, Lisa, is um, uh, uh, do you recommend a PCSK9 inhibitor to this individual? You know that probably there's going to be some benefit, but you also know that the benefit is, you know, there's a law of diminishing returns as your LDL gets lower and lower. Um, and so the question is, starting with an LDL of 85, uh, you know, what's the benefit that necessarily somebody's going to accrue? So that's what I mean by steward of healthcare resources. What do you, so what, how are you, do you go ahead and recommend the PCSK9 inhibitor to this patient? Well, I mean, this is back to what Michelle was saying about in terms of physician judgment and like the most savvy yeah. physicians will be able to know Right. his or her patient and and understand like the the meaning of marginal benefit like you know the the well, sense of financial loss incurred it, like for many people not for many i can't speak but that there is for some people a sense if you're spending more you're getting an even greater benefit you know what i mean it's like right. um so you know you just have to i mean these are the things that um savvy physicians do very well in conversation with their patients and I couldn't, I wouldn't pretend to make a blanket, you know, judgment about how I would approach that problem, you know, for the population at large. But I would certainly, um, I mean, th these are the things in medicine I enjoy most because it's just like getting to know people and figuring out what they care about. And, you know, these are the questions that obviously we as individual physicians have to face and also cannot avoid that there will be, you know, guidelines around this um, telling us how to navigate them. And I, I mean... Yeah. I think that's partly what you're getting at, right? So yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And it's really interesting to me that the decisions right now are actually dictated somewhat by the payers. So the payers would balk at that, right? The payers, if I try, even if, you know, even if, you know, it, like you said, it's about reading the patient and some patients are, you know, anything that new that comes out, that, hey, doc, if you can, if you can reduce my mortality, uh, you know, if, if it's better for me, you know, we should, I definitely want it. If they're, they're telling me now that the LDL 85 isn't adequate and e even lower than 50 is better then hey, that's what I want. Um, right. and so, so if it's that type of patient, you're like, all right, I guess I, I guess I mean, okay, fine. I'll prescribe it. But you start prescribing it for that group of patients and suddenly you, you hit these massive walls and suddenly you have like three pages of, pri of, uh, of, of, of prior. No, but, but then you should, you don't, you should don't, don't, um, yeah. for your thought experiment, let's imagine that there are no walls because you're talking about stewardship. So the stewardship says, you know, should you be, you know, for the good of the community, and the good of the insurance company, or let's say it's the government paying, paying, and let's say they, they don't have, you know, the less is more movements yeah. would want you to say, no, I don't think the benefit is, you know, is worth the candle here. And I'm, I'm not going to use a PCSK9 because it's going to cost too much for the, the small benefit. So my, my, uh, my position would be no. If I make a decision and if I, you know, decide with this patient, I consider that patient a millionaire. I mean, if they have insurance, they, they really, their health, healthcare billionaires. They have all the resources in the, in the world. And, you know, there's no reason for me not to use those resources if I think that, you know, it's, it's appropriate. And it's, it's very unwise from a social uh, perspective, but I'm not responsible. I, 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 um, I didn't design the system, right? I didn't, uh, I'm not uh, the head of an insurance company or the head of CMS. Those are very foolish enterprises in the long term, right? They, they've been surviving for the last 50 years for some odd reason, but they're, they're foolish enterprises. And I'm certainly not going to be, um, uh, you know, um, uh, playing their, their game or, or, or their, 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 right. But, you know, uh, 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 what's the term? Right, I mean, I'm not going to be, um, um, not collaborating, but, uh, what, what's the psychological term? Not gonna be, uh, uh, enabling, enabling that, uh, right. you know, their, their misbehavior. Right. The, but, they're, but, they're but the point is, yeah. but the point is that that utopic that thought experiment it won't work because it just regardless if it's a single payer system or if it's a whatever system we have uh, now with multiple payers, the payers will balk at that, and the payers did balk at that in this particular case, right? So they won't, they almost didn't, wouldn't allow it to happen because hey, you know, and uh, if you, and so the question to me as the physician sitting there was like, all right, am I going to spend maybe two hours doing something where at the end of the day they may still deny it? Um, and I very quickly uh, developed a practice pattern 
where regardless of who the patient was sitting in front of me, even if they were a patient that was very interested in PCSK9 inhibitor because it was a new technology that I had in their LDL was 85. And yes, they had an indication it wouldn't be wrong to give it to them. But, you know, I would say, well, I mean, it, it's not going to be it's not going to be paid for. If you want it, you can pay for it. Um, but I'm not going to I'm not going to spend two hours of resources of the office. To yeah, but you, you have alternatives. And you, sh you can you can tell the patient you spend the two hours. If you want to no, no. do that, you spend the, you. you the yeah, patient. yeah, no, no, no. Of course. No, no. I would say that. I would say that, right. you know, your insurance company is denying it and I would you, is going to deny it. it and so you are going to have to you are going to have to pay for it or you're going to have to get your insurance company to pay for it. And so I, I don't think there were a lot of folks. I don't think that's necessarily uh, the wrong approach that was taken. So at, at the end of the day, it's not really me being a steward of the healthcare resources, right? It's like me uh, kind of acting on the behalf of the payers. Right, but you know, what the, what the less is more is concerned, they're not so much, I mean, they may be concerned about these very high price thing, but they're really more concerned about the thousands of PSA tests that you order right. every right. day without thinking. They're thinking about these things that the system is sort of forced to pay and they want you to be a resource, a steward of those resources as well. All the stress tests that you order, the nuclear, you know, where, where you don't get any pushback. And so, which is an impossible task. I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, ridiculous. And I don't want to play that game. And you shouldn't play that game, you know. <laughs> I think, you know, essentially, the, there's one person, which is the patient who's married to a pair. It may be the government and whatnot. And the government made some promises. It's between, between the two of them, <laughs> you know. And... Uh, and uh, and leave it at that. Well, well, Lisa, we're uh, I I hold uh, the power over the clock here, and uh, and we have to to wrap this up. We need we want to have you back. And uh, can we have a promise uh, live uh, <laughs> on record that we'll talk about some other things uh, uh, that you've written about? Yes, I would love to talk about it. All right, <laughs> this is great. Uh, any final thoughts, uh, Anish? Before no, so that was, it was really, it was, it was really great. I oh, mean, I, I, as, yeah. as part of preparing for this, I, I, you know, went and reread a bunch of Lisa's pieces, and my, you know, I just, I'm constantly amazed at how clearly you write, and, and also, me and Michelle are frequent um, criticizers of folks that seem to be insulated from reality, and it's, it's so refreshing that um, you writing for the. New England Journal clearly seemed to be very much plugged into the real issues that we're facing rather than simply just going along the silly, very simple narrative. So, so thanks for everything that it is that you do. Really fantastic. Oh, really kind. I, I honestly have wonderful editors. I have to say that. <laughs> I, I don't always write very clearly. You know, I, I, I want to say that because, you know, we're, we're sort of, uh, Anish and I have an anti-establishment bias, uh, if you want to put it that way. You know, kudos to the New England Journal uh, for having you and, and giving you this this platform. Um, so, so that's really a, a big uh, bonus point oh, to them. Yeah, speaks, speaks to her talent as a writer. So, wonderful. all right, Lisa, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, bye bye. Bye.